I'm in Nashville, Tennessee right in a second. In fact, if you look over my shoulder right here, you can see the AT&T building. It's what I like to call the Batman building. You see, it's got the uh, Batman. Well, it looks like Batman. Today is our second day on this road trip. We're headed up north. But now that we're in Nashville, we're gonna have another story today. This is a true crime story, and this kind of gets us back on track. After this, we'll be able to just continue heading north from here. Today's story did take place here in Nashville. It's an interesting story to say the least. Uh, you see, in 1997, Paul Dennis Reed Jr. went on a murderous crime spree through Nashville. He would go on to be Nashville's most notorious serial killer, but he did it only by hitting fast food restaurants. At the time, the media dubbed him the fast food killer. First off, let me give you a little bit of the backstory here. Paul Dennis Reed Jr. was from Houston, Texas. His early life was very tumultuous. His mother and father separated when he was just three years old. His mother didn't really want him, so he went to live with his father, and his father was abusive and a raging alcoholic. And it didn't take very long after he went to stay with his dad that he would go off to live with his grandmother. Now, Paul Reed tortured his grandmother on a daily basis. He would lock her up in her bedroom for whole days at a time, and then he would drag a water hose inside and just start hosing her down with the water hose at any given time. He put thumbtacks in her food one time and thought it was funny, and he even tried to set her on fire one night while she was laying in her bed asleep. In 1984, the year I was born, Paul Reed commits several armed robberies, one at a hardware store and then several restaurants in the Houston area. At one of his later robbery attempts, this time at a popular Houston area steakhouse, everything goes awry. He fumbles and botches the armed robbery he was caught and held onto by the employees of the steakhouse and they held him there until the cops arrived where he was arrested. So he gets sentenced to 20 years in the Texas Department of Corrections, but he wound up only serving seven of them before he was released on good behavior. After he got out of prison, he started driving semi trucks in the Texas, in the Houston area. And he did that for a good year before he was involved in a nasty, nasty accident that wasn't his fault. And because it wasn't his fault, he received a massive settlement in the amount of $25,000. Paul Reed, he didn't use the settlement money to go buy a fancy new car or a fancy new clothes or a house or even a new semi truck to drive around, no. He spent most all of the $25,000 on plastic surgery. Paul now wanted to go after a lifelong dream of his, and he did not like some of his features, his facial features and stuff. His lifelong dream was to become a famous country music sensation to make it big and be rich and everyone love him. And then he hits the road traveling from Houston, Texas to right here in Nashville, obviously because Nashville is the ca the country music capital, it, you know, he thought it best that he come here to start his country music career. When he first arrived, uh, he knew it was going to be difficult getting his foot in the door, so he took a job right here at Shoney's, working as a dishwasher. By day, he would come here and work at the Shoney's, and then in the evenings, he would go around to all the country western bars, all the open mic nights, all the karaoke bars, and he would go anywhere where he could play in front of people. 
But it didn't take long though. Um, Paul became increasingly frustrated because his open mic night and karaoke performances never really drew any attention. There were never any talent scouts in the audience like he had heard and seen on TV. And sometimes he played for like only one or two people. And those were probably like the, the bar regulars, the people who were gonna be there no matter what was going on. When he came to that realization though, well, old habits die hard. Paul Reed decided to knock off a few restaurants here in the Nashville area to put a wad of cash in his pocket, but this time it was gonna be different. This time he was gonna learn from the mistakes he made in Houston, Texas, and then he spent the seven years in prison thinking about it. On February the 16th of 1997, at about 8 a.m., Paul Reed pulled up right here outside of this Captain D's restaurant. Now, the restaurant didn't open until 10, but there were already two employees inside cooking and prepping for the day. Paul Reed comes up to the door here and starts knocking to get their attention. Inside of the Captain D's working was store manager, Steve Hampton, and then 16-year-old part-time employee, Sarah Jackson. When Paul gets their attention, Steve yells back at him, we're closed or we're not open yet, something like that. So Paul responds with, I just, want to apply for a job here. Badly needing the help, Steve Hampton stops what he's doing and walks over to the front door to talk to him. It's at this time a passer buyer, a, uh, a person passing, driving down the road, says that when they passed by the Captain D's, they saw two men standing right here at the front door talking. And one of those men had a white piece of paper in his hand, presumably the application. So manager Steve Hampton tells Paul Reed to come in and talk to him about the job. As soon as Paul Reed gets in the door, he pulls a gun from the back of his pants and holds Steve and Sarah up. He forces Steve and Sarah to walk to the back, to the store's walk-in cooler, Paul has both of them laid down, face down, on the floor of the cooler, and then for seemingly no reason at all, Paul Reed shoots both of them, execution style, right in the back of the head. He knew they were going to die before he even entered the Captain D's that morning. He had it all planned out. It's just, it's horrible. After Paul has shot and killed Steve Hampton and Sarah Jackson, he knows that there's a good hour before the restaurant opens. So he took his time and he cleaned out the safe. He cleaned out all the cash register deals. He went into Steve's pockets and took his wallet. And then he even dug through Sarah's purse to see if she had any money. And then before he left the building, Paul went back to the office, to the, Steve's office, and he grabs the security tape out of the VCR this, I mean, we didn't have DVDs or digital back then, so all the security cameras inside of buildings, they all recorded to VHS tapes, and they could either keep those tapes or they would rewrite, and obviously Paul knew this, so he goes and he grabs that VHS tape out and takes it with him so no one could see that he was there. Paul left the Captain D's that morning with over $7,000 in cash, more than $250 in change in coins, and he also took $650 out of Steve Hampton's wallet. That was his family's rent money for that month. The very next day, road crews stumbled across Steve's wallet just off the side of the highway. It was like it had been thrown out the window of a car driving down the highway. Along with the wallet, they also found Steve's driver's license and a blockbuster video card that they would later discover had a partial fingerprint on it that did not belong to Steve Hampton. Now, it was getting close to 10 o'clock at the Captain D's and employee Michael Buttersworth uh, shows up to the store. When he gets there, the front doors are locked and the restaurant is not ready to open. Like all the chairs are stacked up on top of the table still and the lights were still off. It was all unusual. Usually all this is taken care of by the time he gets there. 
So another hour passes by 11 o'clock. Uh, there's customers coming through the drive through that the place is not open, obviously, so they're having to leave. Michael Buttersworth, uh, he just feels like something's wrong. So he walks over to the nearby Waffle House and he calls the police. Within minutes, the Nashville PD show up here at the Captain D's. They break into the back door back here behind the building to find the grisly, grisly scene inside of Steve and Sarah's bodies. Unfortunately for investigators, there really wasn't much evidence left behind at the scene. They, like I said, they did recover that partial fingerprint from Steve's Blockbuster car, but that happened on the next day. But there really wasn't much else. So they had the passer buyers, the people who drove by and saw Steve and Paul standing there talking, they had those passer buyers sit down with a police sketch artist to kind of give them a, an artist rendering of who their suspect was. But they didn't really have any hits and they didn't have anything to go on. Within just a very few short days, this robbery, double homicide here at Captain D's, the investigation here had stalled. One month and one week later, five weeks exactly after the Captain D's robbery, double homicide, on March the 23rd of 1997, Paul Dennis Reed waited right here outside of this McDonald's. Obviously, this is not the same building that was here in 1997. Since then, they have tore it down and built this new building that you see here in its place. But it's still sitting on the exact same spot that it was in 97. It's just a new renovated building in its place. Uh, plus, I, we're only just a couple of miles down the road from the Captain D's. It's like less than three miles down the road. Now, in 1997, McDonald's did not stay open 24 hours like most of them do today. Paul Reed knew this. He knew what time they were going to close. He knew how long it was going to take for the employees to clean up everything and count down all the money at the end of the night. So on the evening of March 23rd, 1997, those closing employees here at McDonald's, they finished up everything and they clocked out. They all went to leave at the same time. They got here to the front door and they unlocked it and opened it to walk out. And just then, Paul Dennis Reed steps around the corner in front of him with his gun in his hand. He forces all of the McDonald's employees back into the stock room and he makes them all lay face down on the stock room floor. And then again, just like at Captain D's, for seemingly no reason at all, he goes down the line to each McDonald's employee, shooting them all execution style in the back of the head. There was four people working in the McDonald's that night. Andrea Brown, Robert Sewell, the store manager, Ronald Santiago, and Jose Gonzalez. Paul goes down the line, shooting them one at a time. He shot Andrea, then Robert, and then Ronald. But then when he gets to Jose Gonzalez, Paul's gun jams. So Jose, realizing this, jumps up and tries to fight Paul for his life. But Paul Reed I guess thinking on his toes, he grabs a knife off of one of the counters. He overpowers Jose and he wound up stabbing Jose Gonzalez 17 times all over his body. Now, thankfully, the assault on Jose Gonzalez did not kill him, but to stop what was going on, Jose played dead. He tried to hold his breath and lay as still as he could on the floor so Paul would think he was dead. And uh, during this time, Paul goes and he empties all of the cash and coins out of the safe and out of the teals and everywhere. He goes to the office and he grabs that security camera recording VHS tape and he leaves. As soon as Jose heard Paul leave the building, he crawls out of the stock room to the phone and he calls 911. This is 911. Hello? 911, what's going on? Somebody what? Please. What's wrong? Please. Are you hurt? 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 Please. Are you hur
Again, within minutes, the Nashville police show up with first responders. Jose Gonzalez is rushed to Vanderbilt University Hospital and he goes directly into surgery where doctors and surgeons worked all night long to save his life. Jose Gonzalez wound up surviving his attack by Paul Dennis Reed and then he would even go on to testify against him later on at his trial, which we're going to come back to in a little bit. At this robbery of the McDonald's, Paul Reed made off with about $2,300, mostly all in coins. But again, for detectives, there really wasn't much evidence left behind. There were six empty shell casings, but none of them had fingerprints or anything on them. So again, just as they did with the Captain D's robbery double homicide, they had witnesses, they had them sit down with that same police sketch artist. Now, the cops really felt like the two cases were connected. The robberies and murders were nearly identical, as well as the taking of the security tapes. But when the two sketches came out, for whatever reason, they the, the Nashville PD didn't seem to think that they matched. I see the resemblance in the two images, but apparently they had trouble seeing it. So they were like flabbergasted. Was this two different people? What's going on here? It's about that time that they are told Jose Gonzalez is out of surgery and he had survived. So they rush over to the hospital and even though he's in really bad shape and can barely talk, he's able to give them enough information for them to believe that both robberies were committed by the same person. So, Law enforcement goes public with this information, telling everyone to be on the lookout. They went on to, to choose a bunch of fast food restaurants, especially in this same area, and they placed officers inside, posing as employees that were armed. So if this were to happen, they would have someone there armed, because they, I mean, they were trying to avoid another massacre. Paul Dennis Reed, was able to outsmart the detectives and the police in Nashville for just a little while longer. On April the 23rd of 1997, exactly one month after the McDonald's robbery triple homicide, Paul Dennis Reed shows up at this Baskin Robbins over 20 miles away from the McDonald's and the Captain D's. Again, just like at McDonald's, this Baskin Robbins it's not the same building. It has been renovated since 1997. But he avoided all of those locations where the police were watching by driving all the way to the other side of Nashville. Now, is that the end of the night? Just as the store is about to close, Paul Reed pulls into the Basket Robbins parking lot. He goes up to the door, which they are just about to lock. He enters the building and holds both employees up at gunpoint. There were two women working inside of the Baskin Robbins that night. The manager, 21-year-old Angela Holmes, and 16-year-old Michelle Mace. Paul tied up both women and he made them lay down on the floor. He went on to taking all of the Baskin Robbins cash and coins from the safe and everywhere. He left the the uh, lid to the safe laying on the floor. He goes to the office and he grabs a security camera, VHS, and he prepares to leave. Now, obviously he's already changed up his routine by not executing the women before he emptied the place of all its money. He then grabbed both women took them out the front door, threw them in the trunk of his car with their hands tied behind their back, and he speeds off out of the parking lot. About 20 minutes after Paul left the building with the two women, 16-year-old Michelle Mace, her brother, pulls into the parking lot here to pick up Michelle from work. I mean, he waited outside for a good 15 minutes or so, and he sees no activity. So he walks over to the door and it's unlocked. So he opens it and walks in. He calls out for Michelle and there's nothing. 
just silence. He felt like something was wrong, so he immediately goes to the first place he can that has a phone, and he calls 911. Fearing that this is another attack by the same person, police swarm this ice cream parlor here in full force. They enter the building with guns drawn, expecting to find both women laying in a back room deceased. But they were nowhere to be found. Both women's purses were there inside of the building with their IDs, and they even had some cash in them. But there's no sign of Michelle or Angela. Within an hour of police entering the Baskin Robbins, the Nashville PD had began a manhunt looking for both of them. Paul Reed kept both women overnight. He drove them from the Baskin Robbins about a mile away, right here to Dunbar Cave State Park. And he spent the night here at the park with both women, torturing and sexually assaulting both of the women, 21-year-old Angela Holmes, and then 16-year-old Michelle Mays. Then once Paul Reed had decided that he was done with them, he stabs them both to death, and then he slit their throat, just to make sure neither one of them survived like Jose Gonzalez did at McDonald's. The next day, I mean, the sun had just come up. It was like 7 a.m. A man walking in this park, he was walking his dog. He stumbles across the gruesome scene. Both women were still laying there where they had been tortured and killed with their hands still tied behind their backs with their own Baskin Robbins aprons. It's wild. But they were left right next to the river just exposed out in the open. It was, I mean, it's really horrible to even think about what those two women went through that night. Once again, though, uh, there isn't really any usable evidence left behind at either the Basket Robbins building or Dunbar Cave State Park where they found the bodies. The police are kind of left defeated by it all. I mean, they're extremely worried for the safety of the public and there just isn't anything there can really do to stop this guy paul reed had obviously mastered the art of being a serial killer and a thief on june 1st of 1997 just one week after the baskin robbins robbery double homicide a man named mitch roberts is at his home with his family when he gets a knock at the front door it's paul dennis reed you see, Mitch Roberts, he's the manager of the Shawnees in Nashville where Reed was working as a dishwasher. And then one week after Paul Reed robbed the Captain D's, Mitch Roberts fired Paul Reed from the Shawnees because he got caught stealing tips. And then when he got questioned about it, he got mad and he like started throwing chairs and it was, it was a big mess. It caused a really big scene. Uh, well, now Paul Reed is at Mitch's home begging for his job back. Mitch tells Paul that he can't hire him back. What he had done, like it was too serious for him to be able to hire him back. So Mitch starts walking Paul back to his car as they were speaking. And once they got to Paul's car, he reaches inside. He pulls out a knife holds it up to Mitch. He then pulls out a set of handcuffs and, said, and tells Mitch to put them on. He tells him that they are going to take a ride over to the Shawnee's building to empty out the safe. In the blink of an eye, Mitch just like turns around and hightails it away from him, running back towards his house. Mitch slams the door on Paul and then he starts yelling to his wife, grab the gun, grab the gun, and this seemed to work because Paul turned around and started headed back to his car. Now, Mitch really didn't have a gun. He was just screaming it. It just came to the top of his head, you know, to scream that, to try and hopefully get away from Paul. But Paul hurries back to his car and he speeds away from Mitch's house. Mitch and his family quickly call the police. It only takes a few minutes for the sheriffs to show up here at his home. 
Mitch tells him the whole story at how he threatened him and blah, blah, blah. Mitch tells him that he believes this guy is the, the serial killer that they've been looking for. And then Mitch drops a bombshell on him. Mitch tells them that at the time all of this happened, his son was f making a home video. He was filming when it all went down, when he opened the door and they have Paul Reed on video. The detectives that are working all of the Paul Reed murders, they're quickly called in. And just as they arrive to Mitch's home, unbelievably, Mitch Roberts' phone rings. Incredibly, it was Paul Reed on the phone. He was calling Mitch to apologize. He says he's sorry for what happened, that he is stressed out because he got fired and his bills were due. He was basically trying to make Mitch feel bad for him so that he wouldn't call the police. But Mitch had already done it. By this time, the police had already looked at the video Mitch's son had done, and they had already compared the image to the artist's renderings, and they believed that this was their guy. So they have Mitch try to be nice to him and, and uh, play along with him. They have Mitch tell Paul to come back to his house so that he could talk to Paul about getting his job back. And Paul agrees. However, they really didn't expect him to, to be dumb enough to come back I mean, after all, this is the suspect that has now killed seven people without leaving any evidence behind. But to all of their surprise, about 30 minutes after they hung up on that phone call, Paul Reed pulls into Mitch's driveway. He's swarmed by police and quickly taken into custody, and Paul Dennis Reed's murderous rampage across Nashville was finally over. Of course, it's going to start raining on me right now. It looks like it's only going to last a moment, though. Now, they couldn't just book him for the murders without getting all their ducks in a row. So they booked him in for assault, the assault on Mitch Roberts. They go back to the lone survivor of Paul Reed's attacks, Jose Gonzalez. They show Jose Gonzalez 300 pictures of different men. And out of all 300 of those images he saw... He picks Paul Reed's picture and says, that's him. That's the guy who attacked me. They then go back to the partial fingerprint that they found on Steve Hampton's Blockbuster video card, and they compare it to the fingerprints where Paul Reed was booked into jail on the assault charges the night before. It's identical. That gave investigators enough probable cause to get a search warrant for Paul Reed's home and his car. While serving these search warrants and searching Paul's apartment and his car, they find a treasure trove of information linking him to all of these robberies and murders. In his car alone, they found DNA belonging to both of the women from the Baskin Robbins. Plus, they found a gas receipt where he stopped and filled up his car with gas right outside of Dunbar Cave State Park on the day of the Baskin Robbins robbery. Once they searched his apartment, they found buckets and buckets of coins totaling over a thousand dollars worth of quarters, nickels, dimes, pennies, that kind of stuff. They find a pair of white tennis shoes that had some blood spots on them that belonged to all seven victims. They were able to, to test the DNA on the blood and it came back to all seven victims. Now, Paul Reed, he's already in jail for that Mitch Roberts attack, but now they have enough evidence. It's time to bring him in for questioning. Investigators interrogated Paul Reed for over eight hours. Reed emphatically denied that he had anything to do with the murders. The, um, I did not commit these nefarious homicides. Now, you can believe otherwise. You can believe with the district attorney. But I did not commit these nefarious homicides. Uh, and you're, you shouldn't be friends. And if I'm the killer and I'm the murderer and I'm the one who's next to you, I guess you really shouldn't be my friend either because it's not right. I'm just trying to say that uh, I just don't want you to be biased. I'm still a human being. You said, you said, if I am the killer, what exactly does that mean? I mean, what... Well, maybe I can rephrase it another way. Let's say that, uh, uh, let's say I am the killer. I don't want you to, to just hate me. And this is, I still want you to be able to show me. No, sir. 
No, sir. I, I think to a degree you're messing with us. No, sir. I'm not trying to play my... I, I wish you wouldn't have said that because I don't want to tarnish our relationship. Even after being presented with all the evidence that they had collected against him, he did not budge. He stuck with the story and he had nothing to do with it. Yeah, I, try, I try to really be a little bit more uh, open and communicative with y'all because um, I really uh, I really want y'all to see the whole picture. I really want y'all to know the whole story. The police basically tell him if you're innocent, then you can prove it in court that they were charging him for it. In April of 1999, Paul Reed would go to court. He would go to trial and they actually did it kind of weird. Instead of it being like one trial where he was uh, being tried for all of it at one time, they broke it up into three different trials, but they were doing them all consecutive. So they would all be back to back to back. It, it took 13 months altogether in and out of court every day for the three different capital murder trials, one right after another. First was the Captain D's murder. Then he was tried for the Baskin Robbins murders. And finally, the McDonald's murders, where bravely, Jose Gonzalez, the lone survivor of the attacks, testified against Paul Reed. And uh, he, he provided some pretty serious testimony that swayed the jury, for sure. At all three of the trials, Reed's defense attorneys argued that his childhood that was so uh, tumultuous, along with having been hit in the head many times throughout his life, has caused him to have CTE, uh, like, you know, this concussions, football players and wrestlers get it a lot. Chris Benoit, the first person that comes to mind. Basically, they were trying to say he wasn't culpable for any of the murders because of CTE. No one bought it. Paul Dennis Reed Jr. was convicted of seven counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder. And for his troubles, he was sentenced to seven death sentences, earning Paul Reed the award of having the most death sentences ever handed down to a single person. You have been found guilty of first degree premeditated murder in counts one, two, and three. Paul Reed sat on death row at Tennessee's Morgan County Correctional Complex as inmate number 303893. While on death row awaiting his execution, Paul Reed's family kept arguing in court that since Paul was mentally unstable, he did not deserve to die. As a result of his family's attempts to spare his life, the state kept postponing his executions several times over and over again, including one time in 2003 where they uh, ordered a stay of execution just hours before his execution. I mean, he was he had he was all ready to be executed, and then at the last second, he was sent back to his cell. After that stay of execution, Paul Reed wrote a letter to the court telling them that he did not want any appeals. He did not want any more stays of execution, regardless of what his family said. He wanted to, to get it over with. Paul sat on Tennessee's death row from the time of his convictions in 1999 all the way up until 2013, where uh, he would spend two weeks at Nashville General Hospital for having breathing issues. He ultimately passed away from complications due to pneumonia, not from a state execution. His death uh, pleased some and disappointed some. Some people just were ready for it to be over. Some people wanted to see him face, you know, to get justice. But whether he died by the state or he died on his own, uh, the results still, they're still the same. Paul Dennis Reed is suspected of another triple homicide robbery that happened in Houston, Texas before Paul ever came to Nashville. There was a bowling alley in Houston that was robbed at gunpoint. All three employees were shot and killed execution style in the back of their head. 
All of the cash and all of the coins were taken from the bowling alley along with the security camera tapes. Plus, it was discovered that Paul Dennis Reed lived only about 10 miles away from that bowling alley at the time of the robberies and murders. It does certainly fit Paul Reed's MO. It sounds just like his robberies and murders in Nashville. The only problem with the whole thing is police arrested another man for those murders. All of the evidence against him was circumstantial, but he was still convicted of those murders and was sent to death row in Texas for that crime. From the very beginning, Max so far claimed his innocence. He has said all along that he was innocent, but he still wound up sitting on Texas death row for 35 years before he passed away in 2016 from liver cancer. The majority of people believe that Max was innocent of that crime, that this was a Paul Dennis Reed committed offense. Now, now both guys are dead. There's no way to tell. As you can see behind me, it's pouring rain. I'm getting out of here. I'm gonna get in the car because we're gonna get heading north and I can get out of this rain. I'm gonna have to pull over somewhere and change clothes now because I'm soaked. That's gonna do it today on Serial Killer Paul Dennis Reed Jr., the fast food killer from here in Nashville, Tennessee. Tomorrow's video is probably not gonna be a true crime story. It's gonna more than likely be like a museum type video, but if that's not your thing, then you can skip past it and come back another day. That's cool. Thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you're new here, go down, hit that subscribe button, then hit that notification bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. If you want to help support the channel, there's links in the description box below you can check out. Thank you all so much. I will see you again tomorrow from this road trip. It'll be our third day. Please, all of you, stay safe, stay healthy, and try to stay dry. I'm not.